السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ الحمد للہ و صلاحت وسلام علیہ رسول اللہ وعلیٰ علیہ وصحاب ہی اجمعین اما بعد برادرز اینڈ سسٹرز آئی ویلکم یو ٹو دا اسٹڈی آف دا سبجیکٹ آف توحید دا ونس آف اللہ سبحان و تعالیٰ وی نو دیٹ اللہ سبحان و تعالیٰ ہے سیڈ ان دا قرآن ان صورت الاخلاص سورہ نمبر ہنڈریڈ ٹویلو نمبر ون قل ہو اللہ احد سے ہی از اللہ دا ون آر بیسک کلمہ is la ilaha illallah there is none worthy of worship except allah tawhid comes from the verb wahada yuwahidu which means being one incomparable it refers to the oneness of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the opposite of tawhid is shirk shirk means associating partners with allah joining partners with allah what is the importance of this subject I will be giving you three reasons. Three reasons about the importance of Tawheed. The first reason Allah has mentioned in the Quran in Surah Nisa, Surah 4, verse 48. Inna Allah la yaghfiru ayyushaka bih. Allah will never forgive the sin of joining partners with Him. Wa yaghfiru ma duna dhalika liman yasha. He may forgive a sin other than that to whom He pleases. Wa man yushrik billah. For the one who has joined partners with Allah, فَقَدِفْتَرَا إِثْمًا azima. He has done the most heinous sin. The worst sin a person can do in this world. He lives on Allah's earth. He eats of the food given by Allah. All the blessings given by Allah. All the favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we join partners with Allah. Allah says this is the worst sin. This is like you can say treason in the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which Allah will never forgive. And we should understand this verse. What is the meaning of Inna Allah la yaghfiru Allah will never forgive. What is the meaning of this? It means that if a person dies without doing tawbah, without realizing his mistake, without seeking the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah will not forgive the sin of doing shirk. But if a person realizes in this world that he was doing wrong, he seeks the forgiveness of Allah and accepts tawheed, the oneness of Allah, then Allah does forgive All sins as given in the Quran in Surah Zumar, Surah 39, Ayat number 53. Secondly, Maduna, what is the meaning of Maduna? Maduna, ulama have given in their commentary, it means sins lesser than shirk Allah will forgive. There are sins which are of the same level as shirk, like kufr, rejection of Allah, rejection of the messenger of Allah, rejection of the articles of Iman. So shirk, kufr, they are of the same level. And there's a third sin, nifaq. Nifaq is a sin where a person is saying that he's a Muslim, But inside he is not a true believer. So all of these three sins are of the same level. Shirk, kufr and nifaq. But lesser than that, sins which are lesser than that, Allah forgives to whom he wills. Meaning, those who are deserving of being forgiven, Allah does forgive them. Now what is the importance of Tawheed? The first reason is that shirk is the biggest sin. And Tawheed saves us from shirk. If a person has Tawheed, he is saved from this biggest sin. On the scale, on the day of judgment, The worst sin is shirk. And this is the first destruction caused by shirk and first point of importance of Tawheed. Second thing is a verse from the Quran from Surah Zumar. Surah number 39, verse number 65. Allah says, Lain ashrakta, O Prophet, if you were to do shirk, Allah has given the example of none other than the most righteous person, our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Allah has said, Lain ashrakta, O Prophet, if you were to do shirk, All your good deeds will go away. Now we know our Prophet ﷺ, how hard he used to work to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As is mentioned in the hadith of Sayyid Bukhari, that he would offer salah hatta tawarramat qadamahu, until his legs would get swollen. Now these deeds, Allah has said about these deeds, that all your good deeds, all the good deeds, la yahbatan amaluk. will be destroyed. So the second destruction caused by shirk is that any good deeds, be it the deeds of the level of the Prophet ﷺ, you add shirk to it and it ends up all your good deeds go vain. So this is a destruction caused by shirk that all good deeds are destroyed. And the second thing which we have learned is the biggest sin is shirk. The third point of importance of Tawheed which we will see now is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has always mentioned 
الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَآمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ Those who believe and do righteous deeds. Believe has always been mentioned first. I did a search in the Quran and I found 50 nataj, 50 results. 50 places in the Quran, you will find الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا first. And وَآمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ next. I'll give you an example. For example, we read the verse in the Quran, Surah Baqarah, Surah 2, verse 158. In the Safa wal Marwata min Indeed, Safa and Marwa are from the signs of Allah. Because Allah has mentioned Safa first. So we go to Safa first during Hajj, Umrah, during Sa'i. We find the Prophet ﷺ went to Safa first and he said a hadith recorded in Musnad Ahmad with authentic chain of narration. He said, Abdaw bima badallahu bi. I start from where Allah has started. Allah mentioned Safa first, we go to Safa first. Similarly, Allah has mentioned Alladina Amanu first. So, what is the first priority? The first priority in learning, the first priority in teaching, the first priority in dawah, in everything is Amanu. So, Aqidah gets first priority. This is a rule we should remember, all of us. Now, these are three reasons of the importance of Tawheed. Number one, Shirk will never be forgiven. Number two, all good deeds go waste. Waste because of shirk. Let's take an example. You are filling water the entire night in a drum and the drum has a hole open at the bottom. All the water drains out. Nothing is saved. All deeds that we do, all the deeds that we do, all deeds go vain. If we do the sin of shirk, it destroys the deeds. And third, First priority is Aqeedah, is Iman, is Tawheed. This is the first priority. Let us remember this, my brothers and sisters. Now, this highlights the importance of this subject. And this is the reason why all of us should remove time in our lives to study the subject of Tawheed. Do you know why? Because it's compulsory to pass in this subject. And the passing marks, you can say it's 100%. If you have some shirk, Tawheed is destroyed. There's no Tawheed then. If you have Shirk, there's no Tawheed. If you have Tawheed, there cannot be Shirk. So it's compulsory to understand all of Tawheed. Do you know my brothers and sisters? So many people, they say, yes, yes, I know Tawheed. But they say, I don't know how to explain Tawheed. If you don't know how to explain, then how will you explain to your own children? How will they get Tawheed? Is it that he has my blood, he's my son, she's my daughter. So my blood is the blood of Tawheed. It doesn't happen this way. And do you know, I have done this test in many classrooms. And if I was to check right now, right now you answer to yourself, you know the answer. If I was to tell you that Allah is the one who is the creator of everything, He is the owner of everything, He is the controller of everything, He is the one who gives us death, who gives us life, who gives sickness and cure, He gives us risk, He gives us children. Everything is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If I was to tell you this, then will you say that if a person believes in all of this, he's passed in the field of Tawheed, in the subject of Tawheed, he's passed, he's believing Allah alone, Allah alone. He's the creator, the controller, the owner, everything in his hands alone. He's the one who gives trials, he's the one who gives blessings. If a person believes in all of this, what will you say? Will you say he's passed in the subject of Tawheed or no? But do you know? Most people, when I ask this, they say, yes, yes, if he's accepting all of this, he's passed. But everything that I told was only a part of the first section. We are going to see three parts of Tawheed, which scholars have divided the subject into three parts, so that a person should not fail in any one of them. And whatever I told just now is only a part of the first part. I did not say anything about the second and the third part of Tawheed. So now, many a times, people are passing this, but they fail in the second or the third. So my brothers and sisters, it's very important to understand all of this subject. I encourage you to spare time from your lives, not only for others, but first and primarily for your own self. Don't be overconfident about this. Yes, yes, I know everything. Don't be overconfident. And I'll also encourage you, this subject is part of fitra. It's very easy to understand. But you have to look at it and understand the main message. These three parts, if you concentrate now, inshallah, you can very easily understand what is being said. 
and remember to grasp the main message. What is the main message? What is being said right now? So my brothers and sisters, with this encouragement and so that we can share this message to people whom we love, our own family, our relatives, our friends, we need to save them from this most destructive sin. If a person is falling in a manhole, won't you save him? That See, take care. If you fall in the manhole, some manholes are very deep. 30, 40 feet, you may die. This is something which is very destructive. If a person dies, a person has to die one day. This is bad if you don't save. It's bad. We should save. It's part of his right on us that we have seen that, so we should save him. But this sin, the sin of shirk, it's so destructive. How can we not care to share this with people? How can we be engrossed with our own lives only? How can we not think of it, my dear brothers and sisters? Come on, let's study this subject. We should know and understand the subject. We should also be ready to share it with this we start the subject. Scholars have divided the subject into three parts. The first part is Tawheed ar-Rububiyya. Tawheed ar-Rububiyya comes from the word Rabb. And we are very familiar with the word Rabb. We say Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. All praise is due to Allah, the Lord of the worlds. Rabb. What is being meant is Allah is the Rabb, the Lord, the cherisher, the sustainer. For example, there's a house. The owner of the house is called Rabbul Bayt. The owner of this house, the Lord of this house. Allah is Rabbul Alameen. And the real Rabb, the Rabb of everything, He's the controller of everything. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Naam, Surah 6, verse 164, Qul, tell them, Aghayr Allahi abghi Rabban. Should I desire someone other than Allah as my Rabb? Wa huwa Rabbu kulli shay. And He is the Rabb of everything. So Allah is the Rabb. Now what is included in the word Rabb? The first thing is Allah alone is the creator. As Allah says in the Quran in Surah 39 verse 62, Allahu khaliqu kulli shay'iyun. Allah is the creator of everything. Wa huwa ala kulli shay'in wakil. And he is the disposer of everything. Allah is the creator of everything. There is no part in this universe. There is no blessing that we see. It's created by someone else. It's created all by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Secondly, Allah is the creator, but he is also the owner. It's mentioned in many places in the Quran. Lillahi ma fi samawati wa ma fi To Allah belong everything in the heavens and the earth. Everything belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Allah says in the Quran in Surah Fatir, Surah 35, verse 13. Walladheena tad'oona min dunihi ma yamlikuna min qitmeer. Those whom you call on, other than Allah, they don't own even the Kitmir. You know what's Kitmir? Kitmir is actually that transparent covering on the date seed. On the date seed, you might have seen there's a transparent covering, which if you remove and you were to taste, it doesn't have any taste, any kind of value. Allah says that those whom you call on, other than Allah, they don't even own something as insignificant as the Kitmir. Meaning they don't own anything. Allah is the owner of everything. Allah is the creator. Allah is the owner. I'll give you an example. This laptop. Now this laptop has been made by a company. Now I'm the owner of this laptop. And imagine if this laptop is not happy. It's crying. The company cannot do, the manufacturer cannot do anything for this laptop. Why? They sold it. I'm the owner. What I want to do, I will do. They can't do anything for this. Allah has not done something like this. Allah is the creator. Allah is the owner. Third thing, Allah alone is the controller of everything. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Sajda, Surah 32, verse 5, يُدَبِّرُ الْأَمْرَ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ الْأَرْضِ From the heavens to the earth, all things are tadbir, the planning. Everything is planned and controlled by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So Allah alone is the creator. Please repeat with me. Allah alone is the creator. Allah alone is the owner. Allah alone is the controller. For example, there may be a factory which is managed by the manager. It is owned by the shareholders and it has been made by the engineers. But Allah is the creator. Allah is the owner. Allah is the controller. We find Allah says in the Quran in Surah Yunus. And I really recommend that you learn this verse of the Quran. It can help you to share Tawheed with people. And clarify so many misunderstandings. Surah 10, verse 107. 
Allah says, if Allah touches you with any adversity, any difficulty, any hardship, read what Allah has said. There is no one, there is no one who can solve that difficulty except Allah. Allah is the only one who can solve our problems. Allah is the only one who can save us from problems. And then Allah says, If Allah intends good for you, Fala no one can stop his blessings from coming to you. No one can stop it from coming to us. There are people who believe that there are certain personalities other than Allah who can solve our problems. And they call out to such personalities and they say, oh, so and so, solve our problems, mother, you help us. And there are people who believe that there are personalities other than Allah who can bestow blessings on us. And they call out for karam from other than Allah, for blessings from other than Allah. And we see in this verse that there is absolutely no one who has any control over good or bad over us. So as a revision of what is included in Tawheed al so that we can get a grasp on what is Tawheed al and maintain that as our Aqeedah, as our Iman, as our Faith, as our Belief. The first is Allah alone is the Creator. Allah alone is the Owner. Allah alone is the Controller. Allah alone has power over difficulties and ease, over sickness and cure. When I'm sick, it is Allah who cures me. Surah 26 verse 80. Allah is the one who controls life and death. Allah alone controls risk, sustenance. Allah alone controls and gives us children and offspring. He has control over everything. Now we look at some proofs of Tawheed ar from common sense, from logic, from some verses of the Quran. First, Surah 21, Surah al verse 22. Allah says, لَوْ كَانَ فِيهِمَا آلِهَةٌ إِلَّا اللَّهِ لَا فَسَدَتَ If there were in the heavens and the earth, Gods other than Allah, impossible. They're not there. But Allah knows that what is impossible. If it was to happen, what would happen? Allah says, Law kana alihatun illallah. If there were in the heavens and the earth, gods other than Allah, lafasadata, they would have been in the state of disorder. The heavens and the earth would be in fasad. There would be chaos, confusion, disorder everywhere. Imagine if there is a car. With two drivers, two. Two steering wheels, two drivers. What would happen to this car? If there are two drivers in one car, la fasadata, there would be fasad. It's so simple for us to understand. And if we were to look at the universe, we can see the harmony. The harmony in the universe with such delicate balances. And the whole thing is running with perfect synchrony. Second argument, Surah Mu'minun, Surah 23, verse 91 and 92. Allah says, Mattakhaz Allahu min walad. Allah has not taken any, any child, any son. He doesn't need any children. You and I need children. We get old. We think who will take care of me when we are old. We are going to die. So we say who's going to handle and take care of my things after I die. Who's going to let it continue. But Allah doesn't need this. Mattakhaz Allahu min walad. Wa ma kana ma'ahu min ilah. And there is no God other than Allah. Along with him, there's no God. Even, even if it was so, if it was so, every God would have taken away what he has created. I made the sun, I made these stars, I made the rain, I'm going to take this and go away. And then Allah says, Maybe some would have defeated others. And then Allah says, Subhanallah, Amma Yasifun. Glorified as Allah and very high above what they attribute to him, what they talk about him. We should not talk these things. Allah alone is the controller of everything. He's the alone. He alone is the Rabb. And further Allah says in Surah 12 verse 39-40 that Yusuf alayhi salam said to his co-prisoners in jail, Ya sahibi asajin, O my companions in prison, Are many gods differing among themselves better? Or is it one Allah, the one, the supreme, the irresistible? Is this better? 
or are many gods differing among themselves? Is this better? What is better? He asked them a question. What, which concept looks better to you? There's an important question about Tawheed al And many people say that, oh, we human beings, we have made aeroplanes. We are sending rockets in space. We have made huge skyscrapers. We are making things of technology, mobile phones, laptops, computers, and so on. So people are arrogant about this, but wish they were to know that whatever we do is actually a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Safat, Surah 37 verse 96, Wallahu khalaqakum, Allah is the one who created you. Wama ta'amaloon, and what you do, what we do, Allah says I have created it. So Wallahu khalaqakum wama ta'amaloon, we all know. We cannot do anything except by the will and power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, He said, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. There is no movement nor power except by Allah. If there is any movement, if there is any power, it comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the fact is, whatever we are able to do, who gave us that idea? Who gave us the strength? Who gave us the initiative? Who facilitated things? Who made it possible? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It cannot happen except by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So here when a person thinks we are the ones who are doing it, in reality they are putting themselves as Rob in competition with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which is absolutely wrong. Who are we? Who are we? What power do we have? What can we do if the ground shakes? What can we do if there's a storm and a tsunami? What can we do if death comes to us? Can we stop death from coming to us? Who are we to compete with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I hope so far you have grabbed the concept of Tawheed or Rububiyah, my brothers and sisters. Now some questions as a test. Have you seen this somewhere? People put this. What is this? It's a horseshoe. People put this at the entrance of their homes. They say when this is there on top of the door, it stops bad luck from coming inside and good luck comes. But do you believe that this has any power? If you believe little bit, little bit power is there in this also. Little bit, not much, but little bit. Even if you think that it has little bit power, we have joined this horseshoe with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Have you seen feng shui bells? People believe that you have these ting, 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 feng shui bells in the house. It brings in good luck. No, there's no power in the bell. All power is in our creator. He's the one who controls everything. Have you seen people wearing these kind of bracelets? They say this kind of copper kara, it is for good luck. But good and bad is controlled by our creator, God Almighty, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some people say, that, oh, this is my lucky day. There's no day which is lucky. There's no day which is unlucky. Good and bad is controlled not by any single day or any date or any such thing. It's controlled by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some people say, whose face I saw today that my whole day went bad. And whose face I saw today that went well. But whichever face you've seen, it has no effect on what happens in the day, whether good or bad, because there's no connection. Obviously, there's no connection. And if a person connects that, that no, this person's face is so lucky that whenever I see his face, something good happens to me. So we have done shirk. We have joined a partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you have seen these kind of lucky stones. People say that these stones, they are connected with certain star signs and they're connected with the date of birth and all of this put together if you wear it in your ring or if you wear it in a locket it has some good effect on your life on your things happening to you do you really think so if you think so then think of it good and bad is controlled by whom by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's not controlled by any stone the stone is lifeless helpless it cannot do any good to its own self how can it bring good to us and the best stone is the Hajri Aswad and the Hajj Aswad, we have the Hadith in Sayyid Bukhari Kitabul Hajj, where Omar Abdullah addressed the Hajar and he said, O oh Hajar, I know that you cannot benefit me and you cannot harm me. I only kiss you because I saw our beloved Prophet Muhammad kissing you. Another thing, the number 13. Is it unlucky? Is it dangerous? Especially if it combines with Friday the 13th. I did a checking on this and I found that in Mumbai itself, there are hotels, five-star hotels, which just don't have the 13th floor. After the 12th floor, you can see in this, in, in the lift, you will find directly there's a 14th floor, there's no 13th floor. Why? 
customers are unwilling to stay on the 13th floor they don't like to stay on the 13th floor so the hotels they do away with the 13th floor so that this kind of a difficulty is not there for them regarding bookings and what about the number 786 the number 786 my dear brothers and sisters it doesn't have any religious significance we don't find our beloved prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam ever using the number 786 the sahaba using this, this number or any other number as people have totaled and taken the sum of all the alphabets used in Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim and they say this total equals to 786 but think of it these alphabets in some other order also will give you this and some other alphabets can also give this number so this is not good actually this is not used in the Quran and Sunnah it's an innovation and if you really believe I have something 786 is there in my number plate so my chances of getting an accident are lesser because I have 786 there and some people say that I have 786 in my somewhere so now even a bullet will not hurt me the fact is good and bad is controlled by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah alone has power over all things and what about the black cat what if the black cat cuts your way what will we do and the fact is Allah has said in the Quran when yuridka bi khayrin fala radda li fadlihi if Allah intends good for you no one can stop that good from coming to you do you think the black cat can stop it? If Allah has intended any good for me today, if a black cat has cut my path, do you think that what Allah has said in the Quran, Fala ali fadlihi, no one can stop Allah's fadl from coming to you? Can the black cat stop that fadl from coming to us? It once happened to me in a classroom when I was discussing the subject, one student got up and he said, he said, no, sir, certain things are a sign. That something bad is going to come to you. They are a sign. I said, the poor black cat, what kind of sign can this be? But yes, if some lion comes and cuts your path, then you can say that this is a sign that there's some trouble. <laughs> but the poor black cat, what kind of a sign can this <laughs> cat be? And what about the star signs? They say these zodiacal signs they have effect on life on earth so far away they have effect on the life on earth but this is not true good and bad is controlled by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the sun the moon the stars no one has effect on life on earth some people put these kind of plates or frames in their house and they believe that these frames they bring in good and they stop the bad from coming in but actually they bring in good and they stop the bad from coming in and this is the same numerical system which is not mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah. One number can have multiple meanings. And it's nowhere there in the Quran and Sunnah. It's an innovation. And if a person really believes these kind of frames bring in good, so this is going to the level of shirk. What about the taweez? So many people believe that this taweez which we wear in our neck, it stops the bad from coming to us. It has effect on us. And if you tell a person who is wearing a taweez that see, just remove your taweez here and go. He said, no, no, something will happen to me on the way. He has faith on the taweez. But the fact is, Prophet Muhammad wasallam said, Man allaka tamimatan faqad ashraka. Whoever hangs a tamima, he does shirk. And the Prophet wasallam did not exclude the Quranic tamima from it. He did not exclude this. He said, any kind of tamima, any amulet that a person hangs, it is shirk. He also said in a hadith recorded in Tirmidhi, he said, Man ta'allaka shayyan faqad Whoever hangs something, he is entrusted to it. Meaning he develops a trust on it. He says, no, this is there. This thing is there. But what about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Isn't it enough for us that Allah is there? My brothers and sisters, these are all examples before us. There are so many which we can see in the world around us. Some people say, tap wood. Why are you tapping the wood? They say, no, it helps to stop the bad from coming to me. The, what can wood, the poor wood table, or poor wood thing which you are doing, what power it has? So there's a question for us. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Zumar, Surah 39, verse 36. Allah says, Alaysa Allahu bi kafin abdah. Is Allah not enough for his slave? When Allah has said he's there for us, isn't he not enough for us? Isn't it enough that Allah is there with us? Why can't we put our trust on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He is Rabbul Alameen. He is there with me 
All my problems are solved. He leaves me. No use if everybody is there with me. Isn't Allah enough for us? Imagine my brothers and sisters, these things on which people put their trust, the bracelet, the amulet, the frame, the horseshoe, the stars, these are what? Their creation. They could not have come themselves into existence. Are we putting our trust on these creation? Why not trust the creator? Why not trust the creator of everything? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Isn't he enough for us? And do you know what happens? Whenever people bring in these other things, Allah leaves them. Allah leaves them. Allah doesn't want shirk. This is the unforgivable sin. Then you lose the help of Allah. Whatever problem, whatever difficulty a person may have, don't do shirk. Allah will leave you. It's no use. It's no good. Allah is enough for us, my brothers and sisters. He is enough for us. We affirm our faith in the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He alone is our Rabb. Let's revise. He alone is the creator. He alone is the owner. He alone is the controller. He alone has control over good and bad. He alone gives life and death, sickness and cure, risk and children and everything of our lives. So my brothers and sisters, we affirm our faith in Tawheed al rububiyah We go on to the second section. And that is Tawheed al-Asma wa Sifat. Maintaining the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the names, Asma, names. And sifat, the sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, attributes of Allah. My brothers and sisters, Allah has mentioned in the Quran, Allahu la ilaha illa huwa, Allah, there is none worthy of worship except Him, lahul asma'ul husna. To Him belong the most beautiful names. What is the meaning? All the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are the most beautiful, the highest, they reach the level of perfection. It doesn't mean that any beautiful name belongs to Allah. Like Yusuf is a beautiful name, it doesn't belong to Allah. All the names of Allah are beautiful. All beautiful names which sound beautiful to us, they don't belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let's remember this. Secondly, all the names of Allah, they are also attributes of Allah. For example, we see in our human world, this is not an example for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a contrast rather. It is not comparison with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the world we see, someone has the name Adil. What is the meaning of Adil? Just. But there are certain people who are named Adil who are very unjust. There are some people by the name Rahim, which means merciful, but they are very harsh. It does happen that there are people who are not according to the name that they have. Their name is different and they are different. But with Allah, this is not the case. Whatever is the name of Allah, it is also the sifat, the attribute of Allah. The asma are the sifat. All the names are also the attributes. He is asami, the name of Allah. Which means all hearing, he is all hearing. He is all basir. The name of Allah, all seeing, he is, he is all seeing. Whatever is the name, he is really that way. So the name and the attribute is the name with the attribute. However, there are some sifat which are not names. For example, it's mentioned in the Quran, La ta khuduhu sinatum wala naum. No slumber, no sleep can overtake him. This is the attribute of Allah. He doesn't feel sleepy, but this is not his name. It's an attribute. So all names are attributes. All attributes are not names. Now you can understand which chapter is bigger. The chapter of names or the chapter of attributes. Obviously, the chapter of attributes. Now my brothers and sisters, in the names of Allah, in the sifat of Allah, we maintain the tawheed. Meaning, we don't give the names of Allah. When we say name, it means the name with the attribute included in the name. We don't give the names of Allah, the sifat of Allah to the creation of Allah. Why? Allah has said in the Quran, in Surah Ikhlas, Surah number 112, verse number 4, وَلَمْ يَقُلْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدٌ There is none who is equal to him, comparable to him. And Surah Shura, Surah 42, verse number 11, Allah has said, لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَعِي There is none like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So my brothers and sisters, there is nobody equal to Allah. But there is no one even comparable, distinctly comparable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some people, they have a misunderstanding. They say that, see, Allah's names and attributes, they are from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. But they say, Allah Mustaan, may Allah save us from these kind of understandings. They say that when Allah is pleased with some slave of Allah, he's very happy with the slave of Allah, Allah gives him one of his own attributes. And they say that this is atai. 
Allah has given and bestowed his own attribute to the slave. The right thing is, Allah is pleased with the slave, Allah will give him Jannat, Jannatul Firdaus, he will give him the best things of this dunya and akhirah. But Allah will never make someone who is like him. Why? Because finally now both of them have now. Allah has of his own and the slave of Allah, the creation of Allah, he has been bestowed by Allah but finally he has. Finally both of them have. So this is equal in that attribute. They are equal. They both have. And Allah has said in the Quran, Laysa shay. What will we do with this verse of the Quran? That there is none like unto him. Allah has said in the Quran, وَمَنْ أَصْدَقُ مِنَ اللَّهِ قِيلًا Who is more truthful than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? When Allah has said there is none like unto him, no one is going to ever be like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No one. There is no one who has been given any attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we take one example for better understanding. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that he is as sami the all hearing, and we are sami you know, we, we can also hear but there's no comparison between the two. Imagine, if a person was to start listening to everything, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala listens to everything. Past, present, future, everything throughout the world. If the 7.5 billion people of the world, they gather together and they call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah can listen to everyone. Allah listens to the whisperings in our heart. Allah listens to our thoughts. Allah listens to what goes on within ourselves. He listens to the one who is dumb. Now imagine if a person, a normal person like you and me, it happens. Suppose he starts hearing everything in the world. He starts hearing all 7.5 billion people of the world, all the animals, birds, jinns, everybody. What will happen to that person? What will happen to that person? In two minutes, five minutes, few minutes, he'll be crazy. He will go mad. We are not created for that. It's good that we cannot hear. We can hear only within limitations, but Allah is the one who hears everything. So there is never any comparison between any attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what we have. He is a sami We took one example and we are sami We listen. But there is no comparison between our listening and Allah's listening. Now what mistake people do is give Allah's attributes to man. And this is shirk in asma wa sifat. Let's take some examples. Some people say that there is someone who has knowledge of everything past present, future. What is this? This is Allah's quality. No human being has this quality. Some people say there is someone who can see everywhere. This is Allah's quality. They say there is someone who can hear everything. Allah's quality. They say there is someone who has control over every single atom in the universe. This is Allah's quality. There is some, someone who can change destiny. This is Allah's quality. There's someone who is infallible, no mistakes ever. This is Allah's quality. So we should not give Allah's qualities to man. There's none comparable to him. My brothers and sisters, this is our Iman. And some people, they do the mistake of giving human qualities to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what they do, they give qualities like they say, Allah also needs rest. Allah also forgot. This is human quality. Allah made mistakes. This is human quality. Allah doesn't make any mistakes. He does not forget. He doesn't need rest. There are verses in the Quran about this. So this is also very wrong. Regarding talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my brothers and sisters, we should remember one rule always. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, Surah 2, verse 169, that is shaitan, makes you say about Allah that which you don't know. A shaitan will make you say things about Allah what you don't know. For example, you can see this table is red. Now you can describe, I saw a red table. Because you've seen this. We cannot see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then how can we say anything about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from our own estimate, our own just guesswork, understanding? We can say what comes in the Quran. We can say what comes in authentic hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wan taqulu ala Allahi ma la ta'lamun. Shaitan makes a person do that. We should not fall into this trap. And Allah has said in the Quran in Surah 16, verse 74, فَلَا لِلَّهِ Don't put forward similitudes, examples for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَعْلَمُ وَأَنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Allah knows, you don't know, you don't know. We should not give examples from our own side for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as we will see ahead in this lecture today, inshallah. 
So we have finished two sections. We have finished Tawheed al rububiyah maintaining the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Rububiya, he alone is the creator, he is the owner, he is the controller of everything. Maintaining the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his names and attributes, that all his names and attributes are for him alone. There is no one like unto him. Now we start the third section and that is Tawheed al-Ibadah. That is maintaining the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his worship. My brothers and sisters, we know that Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Zariyat, Surah 51, verse 56, وَمَا خُلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I have created jinns and men only so that they worship me. We have come in this world to dedicate all our worship for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes. But do you know, worship is not worship if there is shirk. Ibadat is not ibadat if it has shirk. Because Allah has said in the Quran, وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّاهُ Surah 17, verse 23, Surah Al-Isra That your Lord has decreed that you don't worship except Him. No worship except Him. Surah 4, verse 36, Allah says, وَعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ وَلَا تُشْرِكُوا بِهِ شَيَّا Worship Allah and don't join anyone in partnership with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All our ibadah is not ibadah if there is shirk. For ibadah to be ibadah, it should have tawheed. That is the reason that Allah says, I have created jinns and men only so that they may worship me. There is authentic commentary. means It means that we worship Allah alone. Because Allah says, La ta'budu illa yahu. Don't worship except Him. So my brothers and sisters, this is the third part of Tawheed. We maintain and accept Allah alone is Rabb. What is the meaning? Control. Ownership. Creation. All of this in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tasarruf, changes only He can bring. In the names and attributes, we maintain the Tawheed. And third is, in the ibad of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we maintain Tawheed. Why should we worship only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Think of this. Allah alone is the creator. When He is the creator, how can you do ibadah of someone else? He alone is the owner. When He is the owner, how can we do ibadah of anyone else? Who is not the owner of anything, not even the Khitmeer. When he is the controller, how can we do ibadah of someone who is not the controller of anything, not even good and bad over their own self? How can we do ibadah of someone who is the creation? He is the one who controls good and bad, all blessings and trials. How can we do ibadah of someone who has no control on anything? He is the one who gives life and death sickness and cure, risk and sustenance. How can we do ibadah of someone who has no control on anything? All the ibadah should be for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's common sense. It's simple. What's so difficult? We all can understand that all ibadah in all forms is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But human being dedicate ibadah for creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And let's look at an example to understand this better. Imagine there's a person who has one boss, a servant who has a boss. The boss tells him, do this, do this, do this, he's doing that. There's another servant who has 10 bosses. One says, do this, second says, no, do this, third says, do that, fourth says, do this, fifth, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Out of these two, who will have peace of mind? Obviously, the one who has one boss, he will have peace of mind. How does this connect with our topic? My dear brothers and sisters, Dedicate all your ibadah, the ibadah of the heart, the ibadah of the body, the ibadah of the tongue, the ibadah of the money, everything for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Because if He is happy with us, our Creator, God Almighty, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is happy with us, everything is done. And if He is not happy with us, everyone else who is there with you, it's no use. On the other hand, there are people who worship one, who worship the second, who dedicate acts of ibadah for the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. They feel now eighth one is angry with me. You feel the ninth one is spoiling things for me. The tenth one, what will I do about him? Shirk is so difficult. Tawheed is so simple. It's easy. So when a person does shirk, he has so much tension. He's worried about so many. We say, why are you worrying about the creation? Why you worry about the creator? He's the owner. The others are not the owner of anything. He's the controller. No one else controls anything. Dedicate all your ibadah for one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You will be having sukoon in this world and success of the akhirah. But the story remains, my brothers and sisters. 
There are so many people among us, human beings, who dedicate acts of worship, puja, upasana, worship, for other than Allah, for others along with Allah. They say that one God, others along with Him. There are so many who say, I believe in one God, but whom do you worship? They say, we worship so and so. There are so many Christians who say, God is one. Whom do you worship? Worship is for Jesus. We say, no, our worship should be for our Creator. And we have an excellent example, the example of the Mushriks of Makkah. When Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was sent in the city of Makkah, he was selected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was given wahi and guidance from Allah. He was given the message of the truth from Allah. So these people around him, the Mushriks of Makkah, they had a different kind of shirk. They used to worship idols. How many idols did they have? 360 idols. Where were these idols? In and around the Kaaba. But do you know, there are a few things about the Mushriks of Makkah. If we were to know these things, we can understand Tawheed al Ibadah very well. First, that the Mushriks of Makkah, they used to worship idols, but they used to also believe in Allah. They used to believe in Allah. Surah 43, verse 87. Wala man if you ask them, who created you? You have so many idols, but who has created you? La yakhulun Allah. They will say, creator is Allah. Anna yufakun. So Allah says, then how are you deluded? Surah 10, verse 31. Tell them, say, who is it who gives you sustenance from the heavens and from the earth? Who is it who has control over hearing and sight? Who is it who brings out the living from the dead and the dead from the living? Who is it who has control over all things? Mudabbir. They will say Allah. So they used to believe Allah is the creator, Allah is the owner, Allah is the sustainer, Allah is the controller. Good, bad, life, death, everything controlled by Allah SWT. Meaning Tawheed al they were pass. This is mentioned in no less than 12 places in the Quran. If you read Surah Mu'minun, Surah 23, Ayat number 84 to 89. Surah Ankabut, Surah 29, Ayat number 65. Surah Luqman, Surah 31, Ayat number 25 and so on. The question is, when they used to believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the controller, why would they worship these idols? Why? And do you know the reason? It's mentioned in the Quran in Surah Zumar, Surah 39, verse 3. And I request all of you to learn this verse. Allah says in this verse of the Quran that they would say, Ma na'buduhum. We don't worship them. We don't worship them. Illa we worship them only so that they bring us closer to Allah. They would say, they bring us closer to Allah. And it's mentioned in the Quran in Surah Yunus, Surah 10, verse 18. Ha'ulai shufa'una in the Allah. These idols, they intercede before Allah. They intercede for us before Allah. Shufa'una in the Allah. So Prophet Muhammad came. He said, no. There should be no ibadah, no worship for other than Allah. Our kalima is what? Not la rabba illallah. Our kalima is la ilaha illallah. There is none worthy of worship except Allah. All our ibadah for Allah. This is what Prophet Muhammad taught people. This was his basic message. That no, Allah is enough for you. You pray to him. He He's there. All ibadah for him. Now we find that these idols were idols of righteous people. In the hadith of Sayyid Bukhari mentioned in front of you, it's mentioned that these La Tuzamana, these idols whom the Mushriks of Makkah would worship, these were the names of some pious people from the people of Noah salam. And when these pious people died, Shaitan said to people, let's see, how will you remember the righteousness of these people? So what you do? Make their statues. And you will see today also, there are people who put up statues everywhere throughout the world. So make statues and put them in the places where these great men used to sit so that you can remember their righteousness. Now what happened is, people did this to remember their piousness, righteousness. As time passed by and people forgot the origin of these statues, so Shaitan said, see, these are the gods of your forefathers. Worship them. And that's how worship started. So the Mushriks of Makkah used to worship these idols which belonged to righteous people of the times of Noah salam. But why do people end up doing shirk in Ibadah? Why? 
Three reasons I can see. The first is not understanding what is Ibada, what is worship, what is worship. Second is not understanding who is the Ma'bud, who is the one who is worshipped. And third is not understanding the relationship. Let's look at them quickly. First, what is Ibadah? Brothers and sisters, I'm going to show you one very eye-opening verse of the Quran, which if people were to see, they will understand what is Ibadah from this verse. It gives a very important clue. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah 8, Surah Anfal, verse 35, Allah says, وَمَا كَانَ صَلَاتُهُمْ إِنْ What is their Salah near the Kaaba? Who? The Mushriks of Makkah. What is their Salah, Allah said. Salatuhum, what is their Salah? What is their Salah near the Kaaba? Allah says, إِلَّا مُقَانْ وَتَصْدِيَةً Except whistling and clapping. The mushriks of Makkah would near the Kaaba, before the idols, they would whistle and they would clap. And this would be their Salah. Allah says, this is their prayer, this is their Ibadah. So actually Ibadah is of two types. Types which are taught by Islam. For example, Salah, Psalm, Zakat, Hajj, Umrah, Wuzu, Ghusl, Sacrifice, Zikr, Tilawat of the Quran, Dua, Istighfar, all of this is what? This is Ibadah taught by Islam. And even this Ibadah will be accepted only if it is done for Allah SWT alone without any shirk. But there is Ibadah which is not taught by Islam but that is the form of Ibadah which people do. For example, clapping, whistling like the Mushriks of Makkah used to do. Dancing, as many idol worshippers dance in front of their idols. Human sacrifice, self-harm, other such rituals. Allah said in the Quran, in Surah Naam, Surah 6, verse 162, Qul, tell them, Inna salati, indeed my salah, wa nusuki, my sacrifice, wa mahyaya, my life, wa mamati, my death, lillahi rabbil alameen, are all for Allah, the Lord of the worlds. So Islam has taught what? That all ibadah is for Allah alone. And we will do ibadah not whatever how I want to do. I want to clap, I want to dance. No. Ibadah will be only on the way of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So what is ibadah? We look at a definition of ibadah to understand what is ibadah. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah has very nicely put it. He said, al-ibadah is one jamion. Ibadah is a very comprehensive term. It includes every single thing which Allah loves. And we do to please Him. Minal aqwal, whether it's things which we say, like zikr, dua, istighfar, wa amal, or things which we do. Azzahira wal batina, things which are open, which we can see, like salah we are doing, you can see. A person is going for hajj and umrah, you can see. Wal batina, which are hidden. Like things which are in the heart that we trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have faith in Him. We know He's listening to me. That belief, walbatina, that fear for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that hope on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that trust on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second misunderstanding, who is the Ma'bud, the one who is worshipped? We see when the Quran was revealed, at that time there were different things being worshipped. For example, it's mentioned in the Quran, Surah 17, verse 57, about righteous people being worshipped. Or in the Quran, in Surah 5, verse 116, about the prophets being worshipped. And in the Quran, in Surah Najm, Surah 53, we find idols being worshipped. Or angels being worshipped. Or the sun and moon being worshipped. Or the trees being worshipped, as we find from the Hadith from Tirmidhi and so on. But it will not be seen whom you are worshipping. It will be seen you are worshipping someone other than Allah. Shirk is shirk, whomsoever you worship. And Allah leaves ibadah. When someone else comes, Allah doesn't like it. So Allah leaves that ibadah. It's not for Allah anymore. Allah wants tawheed in ibadah. What people say is that for us to reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we need someone in between. Now this is the third misunderstanding. First is understanding what is ibadah. Second is understanding who is the ma'bud. Third is our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this intermediary is actually wrong. Why? Tell me. Can someone be closer than Allah? Allah has said in the Quran in Surah Qaf, Surah 15, verse 16, I am closer to you than your Jagrullaveen. Can someone be closer than this? This intermediary, can he be more merciful than Allah? Allah is the most merciful. Can someone be more merciful than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? 
this intermediary can he listen to us anytime anywhere the way allah can listen anytime anywhere can he be listening better than allah subhanahu wa taala can he be more merciful can he be closer can he understand our problem better than what allah understands allah understands our problem better than what we ourselves understand does this intermediary control anything in the universe can he grant us our request so no everything is in the hands of allah subhanahu wa taala let's look at some examples which people say and which have confused many people for example people say that you need stairs to go up yes we need stairs to go up why the upper floor is far i cannot put my leg up directly at the first floor without stairs the stair is closer to me than that floor but can we say this about allah subhanahu wa taala allah is the one who is closer to us than our jugular vein can we give for him the example of this floor upper floor which is far so we need stairs but allah is the closest to us no one who is closer than allah subhanahu wa taala some people say that yes to get water from the well you need a bucket you need rope you need to put the rope down then you get the water yes we need the water that way yes we need the rope to put the bucket down why because the water is far when the water is far we need a rope we need a bucket the bucket will go in and then we can get the water because the water is far but allah is closer to us than our jugular vein how can we give this example for allah subhanahu wa taala some people say don't you need a lawyer to go to the judge yes we need the lawyer to go to the judge why because the judge cannot understand my problem we have to explain to him in his legal language and if the opponent has a better lawyer i will lose i need to have a lawyer to put forward my case and the judges are not always fair they can be unfair they can be unjust knowingly even unknowingly but allah subhanahu wa taala understands our problem better than what we understand allah is closer to us than our jugular vein allah is the most merciful allah is always fair he is never unjust the judge cannot listen to two lawyers at one time allah is the one who listens to crores of people there's no comparison between allah subhanahu wa taala and this judge so most people blunder in tauhid al ibada as allah has said in the quran in surah yusuf was number 106 وَمَا يُؤْمِنُ أَكْثَرُهُمْ بِاللَّهِ Most people, they believe in Allah. إِلَّا وَهُمْ مُشْرِكُونَ Except that they do shirk along with belief. They believe in Allah, but they also do shirk. They believe what? Many people believe in Tawheed al-Rububiyah. But when it comes to Tawheed al-Ibadah, many people, they do shirk. Before we end this subject, we will look at two questions which people have and due to which many people misunderstand what Islam actually teaches. The first question which people have is the question of Shafa'ah. that intercession islam does teach intercession yes there is a intercessor but what is the status that islam mentions about the intercessor and intercession we find that allah mentions in the quran in surah baqarah surah 2 was 255 man zalladhi yashfa'u indahu illa bi izni who is the one who can intercede before allah except by the permission of allah meaning what the intercessor can intercede only by the permission of allah illa bi izni meaning when allah will give permission and to whom allah will give permission only then can that intercessor intercede we cannot say he is my intercessor it is allah who selects his intercessors who will intercede and second thing which is mentioned in verses of the quran as in surah al anbiya surah 21 verse 28 allah has said wala yashfauna they will not intercede wala yashfauna illa liman irtada except for the one whom allah is pleased with they will not intercede except for the one whom allah is pleased with meaning intercession is for the one with whom allah is pleased intercession is by the one whom allah is pleased with meaning it's all in the hands of allah subhanahu wa taala this is the islamic concept of intercession we have worldly examples for example someone is given a prize and an award in a function at the hands of a guest now that guest is not giving the prize the organizers are giving the prize from the hands of the guest it's the organizer giving the prize this is a worldly example for us to understand that getting the prize from the hands of someone doesn't mean he's the one giving it may be someone else is giving through him to give him that honor 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving honor to those intercessors on the day of judgment, but the decision is all Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's. The second question which people have is about dua. Regarding dua, the Islamic concept is Allah has openly declared in the Quran, Uduni, Astajib lakum. Ask me, I will answer your prayers. Allah has told this without any distinction that only righteous people should ask me, sinners don't ask me. Allah has told this without any distinction that only knowledgeable people should ask me, ignorant people don't ask me. Allah has not said this. It's for everyone. Uduni, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah said, ask me. Astajib lakum, I will answer your prayers. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said, ad dua huwa libada. Dua is ibada. How is it ibada? It is an ibada where a person realizes Allah is the one who is listening. Allah is the one who gives. He realizes that he has to be humble. A very big billionaire is asking, doing dua. He makes himself humble. He's begging before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is ibada. People say that, no, we need an intermediary to reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, we have the same questions. Who is closer to you? Who is more merciful? Who can listen to you? Who can understand your problem? Who can grant your request? Who is the one who is controlling the universe? Who is the one who can grant your request? The same questions. Hasn't Allah taught us to say in the Quran, Iya kanabudu. Allah, you alone we worship. Wa iya kanastain. And only your aid we seek. Yes, Allah has taught us this. Some people say that, see, can't we ask worldly help? There's a distinction. For dua, it is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For worldly help, obviously, we find there are a hadith, our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu himself has asked help from people. But there are some clear distinguishing things which separate this from dua. For example, whomever we are asking, he has to be hayun, living. Number two, he has to be hazard, present. Someone who is not present, I want to tell you, help me to lift up this table. Uh, you have to be present. Then I can say, come on, help me to pick up this table. It's no problem. Third, he should be qadr. I can tell you, help me to lift up this table. But I cannot tell you, increase my life for two days. I cannot tell you, increase my rizq. Rizq Allah gives. So my dear brothers and sisters, we have analyzed why people go and do shirk in ibadah. We have looked at this problem a little bit in detail. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Anam, Surah 6, verse 91, they do not value. They do not value Allah as they ought to have valued. As they should have valued. They don't value Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that way. We should not do this. We should value the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We should dedicate all and all our acts of ibadah for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Lastly, we will end this by quoting the words of Luqman to his son which is mentioned in the Quran in Surah Luqman, Surah 31, verse 13. Allah tells us that Luqman told his son, Ya Bunaya, O my son, La tushrik billah, don't join partners with Allah. Inna shirk la zulmun azim. Because shirk is the worst zulm. The worst wrongdoing is shirk. A person does shirk, this is the worst sin that the person can do. Zulmun azim. So Luqman is the example for every single Muslim father. We need to teach Tawheed to our children. And in the Quran, there is an example of a son who speaks to his father also. And do you know who is this? This is Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ibrahim alayhi salam. If you read Surah Maryam, five times we find Ibrahim alayhi salam is telling his father, Ya Abati, Ya Abati, oh my father, oh my father, with great respect. Abati is used for respect. He's telling his father, giving him the invitation to Tawheed. Meaning, if you are the father, teach your son, teach your children. If you are the son or the daughter, teach your parents. Whoever knows Tawheed, he cannot stay quiet about it. Now you cannot say, oh, let shirk happen. You love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you care for people. Our Prophet used to care for people, we care for them, we want to save them from the fire of hell and from the worst sin which Allah will never forgive. So we end the session with the verse from the Quran, from Surah Al-Isra, Surah 17, verse number 111. Allah says, takbira. Proclaim the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't just accept, oh I accept. Proclaim it. Kabbirhu takbira. Declare it before people. Go on, pass on the message of Islam. I encourage all of you brothers and sisters 
to learn the subject, learn these verses of the Quran and share this message to all those people who are really in need of the subject. May Allah make us of those who live on Tawheed and die on Tawheed and who share the message of Tawheed to people and act on it. Ameen wa akhru dawana and alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Alhamdulillah. This series is sponsored by one of our brother in Islam for Sadqai Jariya of his family. Aise hi aur videos banane mein hamari madad karein.